Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. It's third in our series of The Road Ahead and why we've been looking at macroeconomics the last couple of weeks. Today, we'll focus specifically on apartments, syndication, and legal changes headed our way. And we've got three great guests on the Real Estate Guys radio program. If you love real estate and have always wanted to own your own business, listen up. The Real Estate Guys and their panel of experts want to teach you how to go full-time fast in the real estate syndication business. These next few years may go down in history as one of the best times ever to acquire investment real estate. There are deals everywhere if you know where to look and how to assemble the resources. The Secrets of Successful Syndication Seminar will show you how to make big money doing big deals from a team of experts that have syndicated projects totaling more than $1 billion. Don't wait for someone to give you a raise or create a job for you. Attend the secrets of successful syndication and learn how to build a team, raise capital, find deals, and make full-time money in six months or less. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. All the big players use syndication as a way to diversify risk, optimize profits, and earn big money. You can too. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms, and with me as usual, our co-host, financial strategist, Russell Gray. Hey, Robert. We are in the middle of our series, The Road Ahead. A bunch of our friends are helping us out and taking a look at the future. What's happening this year? What are the changes they're monitoring? Where do they have their eyes? And the last couple of weeks have been pretty heady. Dr. Chris Martinson and George Gammon talking about the Fed and all kinds of big picture stuff. So we thought this week we would bring it back front and center to real estate and we've got three awesome guests today yeah it's going to be great you know at the end of the day what we have to do and since i became a macro freak and macro watcher it's always trying to relate back how is what's happening up in the stratosphere in the weather of the economy and the economic financial system how does that all trickle down to main street and how does it affect the decisions i make obviously we follow the capital markets interest rates that's very important we learned in the gfc back in 2008 if you don't pay attention to that stuff by the time it manifests at the street level it steamrolls you and you don't have time to adjust. So note to self, pay attention to the big picture. But if you live with your head in the clouds all the time and you never get back to the street, you don't quite know what's going on. So we like to get our thumb on the pulse of what's happening at the street level by talking to people that are day in and day out in the trenches, managing properties, making deals, working with investors, and hear what they have to say. So I'm really looking forward to today's show. So we're going to first hear from Brad Sumrock. We call him the apartment king. He invests in apartments in lots of different places in the U.S. And every year about this time, he does his big hour-long apartment forecast. That's coming up here shortly. But as he's preparing for it, we'll pick his brain on that. And then we've got attorney Marisa Raoul, who's going to share with us some of the legal changes coming down the road, especially when it comes to syndicating real estate, one of our favorite topics. It's going to be a great show. Up next, Brad Sumrock, today on the Real Estate Guys radio program. Real estate investment advice right in your mailbox. Sign up for the free Real Estate Guys newsletter at realestateguysradio.com. Registration is now open for the Real Estate Guys 20th Annual Investor Summit. Imagine spending an entire week with like-minded investors, world-class educators, and real-world professionals. Returning in 2022, the editor of the Gold Newsletter, Brian London, international real estate developer, Beth Clifford, the author of The Creature from Jekyll Island, G. Edward Griffin, Jim Rohn's 18-year business partner, Kyle Wilson, and the rebel capitalist, George Gammon. And joining us live and in person for his 10th Investor Summit, best-selling author and the Rich Dad Advisor for Real Estate, Ken McElroy. Plus, lots more to be announced. It all begins June 10th, 2022 in beautiful Belize. Visit realestateguysradio.com and click the tab that says Summit to preserve your spot. Go to realestateguysradio.com, click Summit, and make plans to spend a week with the Real Estate Guys, George Gammon, Ken McElroy, and an all-star faculty on the 20th Annual Investor Summit on Sand. Self-storage is an asset class that has stood the test of time. Going into the Great Recession of 2008, self-storage had the least negative impact of any of its commercial real estate peers, and it had explosive growth coming out of that time during the recovery. Fast forward to 2020, and you'll see that same pattern during some of the worst part of the pandemic. Hi, my name is Dave Zook, founder and CEO of The Real Asset Investor. 
Our operating partners are some of the best in the business, and we've had great success over the last decade buying mom-and-pop operated self-storage facilities and taking them to the next level by forcing value through increasing the square footage, adding climate-controlled units, bringing in our professional management teams, and turning the project into an institutional target. We have self-storage investment opportunities available for accredited investors who are interested in investing in this space for cash flow, tax impact, and huge equity appreciation. Reach out to us today at self-storage at realestateguysradio.com. Hi, this is Lawrence Yuan, Chief Economist with National Association of Realtors, and you are listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program, heard every weekend on this great radio station all the time at realestateguysradio.com. Now in our 26th year of broadcast, at the beginning of the year, we like to poll our friends and see what they're looking at, what they're paying attention to, and any predictions they might have. And our first guest today uh, regularly makes some predictions at the front of the year when it comes to the world of apartments. Let's say hello to the apartment king, Brad Sumrock. Hey, Brad. Hey, Robert. Thanks for having me on today. Thrilled to have you. I know that uh, every year, right about now, you've got your head in the space. You're looking out at the horizon, figuring out what the trends are, where the markets are, demographics, and all that stuff. So uh, share with us some of the big picture notes when it comes to apartment investing, things that you're paying attention to for 2022. Yeah, well, let's just say 2021 was probably the best year ever for apartment investors, at least in the 20 years that I've been doing it. And I can't, wow, I can't believe it's been 20 years. I did my first deal in 2002. And um, so 2021 was a banner year. And I'm talking about, you know, apartment values, returns for investors basically exceeded just about anybody that has a deal right now. The returns are exceeding expectations. And part of that is because the rents have gone up so much and the other thing is apartments are one of the darlings of, of the investor community. So what's happening is there's so much capital coming into apartments. The big question is like, are there still good deals? You know, cap rates have continue to trickle down and pricing continues to go up. And so what's going to happen with apartments in 2022 is the big question. Yeah, absolutely. And this is anytime you have a product niche that gets hot whether it's built to rent or single family or commercial in a particular area or just a, a development zone, people start to wonder, hey, uh, the prices are going up and, and, and how long can this continue? And of course, the apartment space has been strong for a lot of years. Pretty much every January or February, we have this discussion. And for the past several years, this has been one of the things. Hey, it's been a good year. Things are going up. Cap rates are still squeezed down. So uh, share with us some of the things that you're looking at specifically. Well, we're looking at number one, what are the top markets to invest in? Yeah. So as we know, all markets are not equal. Some markets suffered tremendously during the pandemic. Some have rebounded above and beyond where they were before the pandemic. Some haven't. There's been a lot of migration patterns. So we're looking at which markets are the top markets to invest in, where people are moving to, where jobs are being created, uh, where people are moving away from, you know, where the, the laws continue to be favorable for landlords. So that's one of the top things we look at is the markets. Well, and let's talk about that for a minute, because you've always talked about landlord friendly as a, as one of the criteria. And that just makes sense. If you think about it in the U.S., and the, there's apartments everywhere, but in the U.S., uh, different states have different laws. Some states are more tenant friendly. And they're going to err on the side of the tenant. Some states are more landlord friendly. And a great shortcut that you talk about is just focusing on those markets that are landlord friendly. Now, you layer over that what happened with the pandemic, and not every state reacted the same way in terms of eviction moratoriums and how long they were on and all those kinds of things. So that's why it's uh, all real estate is local. Exactly. And that's correct. Like, you know, I've, for 20 years, I've been investing in landlord and business friendly environments. And I think that during the pandemic, it was even more important. However, you know, there were some things that impacted everybody nationally. But then when it came down to the local precincts, you know, maybe that judge in that precinct, they, they had more uh, flexibility with landlords in some areas and more flexibility with tenants in some areas. And so that's important. And then the other thing that's happened is that even though for a period of time, no evictions were permitted, now there's billions of dollars of aid 
that's still coming to tenants and to landlords that didn't get paid. So Brad, let's talk about that for a minute, because I think one of the things people are concerned about when they look at the apartment space is how competitive it is. And that's because not only are individuals interested, not only are folks like you and your students to put together syndications to invest in apartments interested, but also the big hedge funds, the real estate investment trusts, the insurance companies, a lot of people are chasing the apartment space. And yet that's part of the safety in it because so many people occupy apartments. Are you taking a look at global demand when it comes to how many units are built and how many need to be? Well, I mean, that's one of the things that I'm putting together for my forecast that's coming up, that like there's going to be like over 400,000 new units coming online yeah. in 2022. Now, part of that is just the general construction cycle, but part of that were units that were supposed to come online in 21 that were delayed due to, you know, labor shortages, supply chain shortages. So there is going to be a bunch of new units coming online. But the thing is, is that there's still a shortage of housing. And there has been for many, many years. And so when we talk about global demand, you know, people are looking for yield, not just individuals like you and me and the people that come to our events, but the hedge funds and Wall Street and international organizations. And so Here's the interesting thing for people that have been in the business, they look at apartments now and say, oh my God, it's, it's expensive. Like I used to pay 40,000 a unit for something that's now 80,000 a unit. Right. Yeah, but the rents were $800 a month and now they're $1,200 a month, right? But the thing is the, the sector continues to attract new buyers and new capital because of the opportunities and because of some of the things that I'm going to talk about on the 16th. Well, and let's talk about that because every year you do this forecast and uh, we've been pointing our listeners to it for the last several years. And I know we're catching a little bit early. You've done some of the preparation, but you don't have it all flushed out yet. But uh, on the 16th of February, uh, if you're listening to the show in its current uh, state, uh, you're going to do uh, an apartment forecast and it's going to go into a lot more detail than we have time for today. But if you miss that, there's also a mechanism for you to hear the replay. And it's all free. It's something Brad does uh, for his students and for the general audience uh, every year. But it, not every year is the same. I mean, there's some recurring themes, right? The last several years, hey, the pandemic has been uh, par overshadowing the, the market, if you will. But at the same time, the printing of all this money means that tenants are able to pay more. And with the eviction moratoriums almost all gone, we are seeing good, durable, rents and therefore prices are going up. So there's some of those trends, but there's also some of the maybe less, less obvious things that you look at. Can you share some of those with us? Well, yeah. Like, so one of the things I want to talk about is like, what could investors expect to return? Because, you know, that's the community that I speak to. And a lot of that is your community as well. So like, you know, in the past, you know, it wasn't uncommon to expect like double digit cash annual returns. Yeah. And, and so we're going to talk about what type of cash returns investors can could expect, but also what types of total returns, because you see maybe like it's more of a seller's market. There's a lot of capital chasing deals. And so again, some people were like, well, the returns aren't as good, but the thing is the rent growths now are a lot higher. We had unprecedented rent growth in 2021, double digits in most cities. I mean, in, in DFW, it, it was like almost 20%, like in, in another market that I'm active in, like Tampa, it was like almost 30%. Wow. And so, so anybody that owned apartment buildings in pretty much every major Sun Belt market or Rocky Mountain market, their asset is worth so much more right now. And so I will spill the beans a little bit, but that trend is going to continue in 2022. And I'm going to talk about that more on the 16th. Well, I'm glad you bring that up because there, it doesn't seem obvious every time uh, how much things that we hear about in the news impact the apartment space. But, you know, you mentioned logistics and supply chain. When lumber was up three times, what many developers decided to do was to put pause, right? Just stop building until the prices came back in line because it didn't make a ton of sense. It was going to be profitable. And in order to pay those kinds of prices, you've got to raise the price of the apartment complexes and pretty soon that dog doesn't hunt, right? Now that we've seen the supply chain ease up 
up a little bit in construction materials. You are seeing those projects underway. But there's an opportunity when we have this demand that hasn't been satiated, meaning the new builds haven't started. That's when the existing apartment buildings look that much more interesting. So what are you seeing in terms of, you know, what you talk to your students about? Is it all resale or do you consider new construction as well? Well, like in the past, I was mainly teaching people and doing like C deals. So we're buying deals built in the 70s and 80s. And over the past few years, the cap rate spreads between like a C deal and a B deal and an A deal started to narrow. Right. And so like, like 2021 was a big year for me personally and a lot of my students in my program that we were buying A-class deals. Now we haven't gone down the path yet of like building properties or buying like brand new lease ups, but there could be an opportunity there to do that because, you know, the investor community in, in general has been willing to pay so much for these C deals that are value added opportunities. And then what we've been finding in 2021 and, and, and the trend is gonna continue in 22 is like, we're able to get rent bumps right now in some of these properties without doing much, if any renovation. But I can just tell you like everything across the board right now in the A, B and C space has been performing really well. You know, we're gonna be seeing some you know, during the pandemic, there was a big movement to suburban areas, for example. Right. And now we're seeing more movement. We're still seeing suburban areas being very popular, but we're starting to see a return to the urban areas as the workforce has shifted. People are coming back to work, but they're able to work from home or have more flexible, you know, working schedules. And so they especially like the millennials or the aging millennials, they want to be in that live, work, play environment. So we're seeing a lot of uh, gains right now coming into 22 uh, back into the urban space. Now let's talk about another part of demand, Brad, and that is you not only invest, obviously, in apartments in your own account, but you syndicate and you help people to syndicate and you invest passively, kind of the three ways you can invest in apartment buildings. And we both do them all. Uh, but let's talk about the demand you're seeing from the passive investment side. So you train a lot of folks who want to be syndicators. They want to raise capital by apartment buildings. But what do you see on the other side? Has there been a good demand from the passive investors or uh, has that tapered off? What's happening in that regard? I mean, I think the demand for passive investors is going up. Okay, there's more demand because I think multifamily, there's this more awareness. Like two, three, five years ago, it was like, why would I invest in apartment building? Like it just wasn't as well known. And one of the benefits of the sector being so hot, so to speak, and I'm putting parentheses around that word hot, is that so many people know about it. Yeah. You know, so it's not just people like me out there that have been doing it, but some of the the big social media influencers and you go to like a Tony Robbins event and they talk about, Tony talks about he owns apartments and some of the financial advisors talk about, you know, you need to have some, some money and multifamily. And so it's just become a lot more aware to Wall Street and professionals. And so there's a big demand for passive investing right now. So like the least of the worries that I have whether it's a deal I'm syndicating myself or even one of my brand new students is their ability to raise the money. Well, and to that point, we're thrilled to have you uh, teaching as you normally do at our upcoming event, The Secrets of Successful Syndication. We spend a couple of days twice a year talking about raising capital for real estate deals and uh, always love to have you talk about that. So looking forward to seeing you in March. Yeah, I'm excited to be there. I, I'm glad I'm able to make it again. And it's been like, what, six years now since I've been at that event. Event and I, I wouldn't miss it. You know that, Robert. Love that. Hey, um, let's circle back. At the beginning, we were talking about some of the markets, and I know you haven't finalized your top 10. People will be able to hear that when they listen to your apartment predictions uh, webinar you're doing. Um, but what are some of the markets that you like? Let's just give the listeners maybe some ideas and then what it, what it is that you see in those markets, why you like them. I'll start by saying like I have always been bullish on Texas and Florida, but I've always said Texas first. And going into this year, it's still Texas and Florida, but now it's Florida and Texas. I mean, Florida has really flipped and kind of leapfrogged, and it's pretty much almost every market. South Florida is a market that I used to think was like, okay, that's not like the rest of Florida. It's not like the rest of the United States, but South Florida 
is on fire with like rent growth. Um, and surprisingly, like the, the price points there and the cap rates, yeah, they're higher, but they're not like substantially, substantially higher than, than some other, you know, major markets out there. Tampa has been like the number one to two market in terms of rent growth. I mean, there's a thousand people a day moving to Florida and 100 a day going to Tampa. And, and Tampa is a great market. Jacksonville is a great market. Orlando has bounced back from the pandemic. So just about any Florida market, it's hard to go wrong. Now, obviously, you still need to underwrite and have operations and all that stuff. But in terms of market selection, like Florida, to me, in 2022 is number one. Texas is number two still. And, and of course, it depends on the market. There are like DFW, for example, Austin. These are like in my number two area. The Rocky Mountain region is, is hot and it's good. And it's there's a lot in demand there and a lot of people are moving there. And the thing is, what we really track, Robert, are where are jobs being created? Where are people moving to? Okay, so as people started to work more from home, they have more flexibility on where they could live. People are moving to warmer climates or climates that are a little bit more uh, tax friendly and areas that have a little bit lower cost of living. So we're seeing a lot of growth in the Rocky Mountains, in Texas, and in Florida. Now, a couple other markets that I've been studying, and I'm not going to reveal everything right now, but like I'm really impressed right now with Alabama. And there's a couple really good markets in Alabama, like Huntsville and Birmingham, that like in the past, I would have been like, oh my God, like Alabama, like that. But there's, there's going to be some really uh, interesting markets in 2022 that people really want to give strong consideration to. Excellent. All right. Well, if you would like to be invited to uh, listen live to Brad's Apartment Investor Forecast, it's coming up uh, February 16th, or you can hear the replay. And in order to get that information, all I have to do is send an email to Brad22, Brad22 at realestateguysradio.com. We'll get you the link, uh, but also we'll tell you about the upcoming R to R event. So rat race to retirement. This is an event you've been doing for many, many years. I've attended myself several times. And if you are thinking about uh, this space, whether you would want to learn to passively invest in apartments, or if you want to roll up your sleeves and be the person that's chasing deals and markets and so forth, that's coming up. Tell us about the next R to R, Brad. Yeah, well, the next R to R is going to be epic. And I don't want to overuse that word, but you know, we have uh, decided to do our first R to R of the year, not in March, but in May. Wow. And that's a big decision. And normally we would be promoting the R to R already because we, for nine years, we've done it in March. Yep. So like May, it's going to be our biggest R to R. Um, we've changed R to R uh, from a two day event to a three day event. So this R to R in May is going to be outstanding where we teach our proven framework we do bring in some guest speakers at R2R, R, although R2R, R, I am the main teacher. And it's really about teaching, you know, the proven steps to finding deals, evaluating deals, uh, getting the deals financed on the debt side and on the equity side and getting them, you know, to the closing table. You know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, as you know, Robert, and, you know, you, you're always at these events uh, supporting us and speaking. But I mean, hundreds and hundreds, and that's not an exaggeration of people that I have personally mentored started at R to R and have really just knocked it out of the park. Well, the first time when it blew me away because it was two days back then, it was all you for two days, 16 hours, just teach, teach, teach. And I really got an appreciation of uh, your, what we call your seat knowledge, right? How much you'd been through and, and just some great distinctions. Like when someone's done something for 20 years and they can give you some of the shortcuts, that's awesome. But I will say this last time when you said three days, I'm like, well, okay, three days. But you had Damon John there. We got to hang out. That was fun. People got more networking time. They got to meet some of your students who have been successful doing it. And I think that's such a good point is what we call proof of concept. It's one thing for the guy that's got thousands of units to stand on stage and say, here's what you do. It's another thing when you meet people that are really doing it. And I appreciate at your events how accessible those people are to get into conversations and to share what they know. It's a, it's a great environment. It's not a scarcity-based environment. It's everybody sharing what they're doing, supporting each other. Uh, I would definitely consider going. It's going to be both live and virtual this time. Absolutely. Like we're finding right now that 
you know, half of the world wants live and there's still a large percentage of people that want virtual. And you know what? It's not just about the pandemic anymore. It's about travel. It's about children. It's about cost and travel costs. So yeah, there's going to be a live option. There's going to be an in-person option. I mean, I always prefer in-person, but hey, look, if you can't do in-person, it's better to do it virtual than not do it at all because the quality of the information, the education, the networking, and we figured out how to do some pretty uh, amazing virtual networking. And let me just talk about the three-day too. Like when I did the two-day, some people would say like, Brad, it's like drinking from a fire hose. And so one of the reasons we went to three days is because we learned that for most people, the mind can only absorb so much at a time. Right. And we did add a lot of new content, but the pace at which we go and then the opportunity to do uh, breakout sessions and sharing in groups what you've learned and reinforcing what you've learned and then adding in a little bit more networking time so that people could start building those relationships We've gotten a lot of great feedback on that three-day format. Well, if you're interested in that, we can send you the details about the R to R event as well as invitation to Brad's apartment forecast for 2022. All I have to do is send an email to Brad22, Brad22 at realestateguysradio.com. Well, Brad, I'm looking forward to the full-on forecast because it's always entertaining and you always share some good nuggets, but we appreciate what you've shared with us today. Thank you, my friend. Yeah, and thank you so much for having me. There's Brad Sumrock, the apartment king. More when we come back, and we're going to play Real Estate Trivia next. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Live nationwide, you're listening to the Real Estate Guys. Find out more at realestateguysradio.com. Stop for a moment. Why are you listening to this show? Are you dreaming of a bigger, brighter financial future? More personal freedom to live life on your own terms? What if there was just one skill that could make it happen? There is. Sales. Robert Kiyosaki says every entrepreneur must be good at sales. It's true for investors too. Sales is how you attract money, people, and opportunities. Sales is the skill used to negotiate deals and lead your team. Sales skills are essential to success. The good news is, it's a learnable skill. The great news is, we've created a two-day interactive workshop to teach those skills to you. Make plans today to attend How to Win Funds and Influence People, Mastering the Art of Financial Selling. For dates and details, send an email to sales at realestateguysradio.com or visit realestateguysradio.com and look under events. Gain the skills you need to succeed. Email sales at realestateguysradio.com or look under the events tab at realestateguysradio.com. Forbes rated Memphis the best cash flow market in the nation. And our good friend Terry Kerr at Mid-South Home Buyers has been the premier turnkey rental property provider in Memphis for over 13 years. With an A-plus rating for the Better Business Bureau, Terry has renovated over 750 houses. Real Estate Guys listeners have snapped up hundreds. Discover what these satisfied investors already know. Mid-South's properties are completely renovated with a one-year warranty and a lifelong rental guarantee. They're affordable, well-managed, and easy to own. Perfect for beginning investors and veterans alike. Get in on the action. Contact Terry and his team via email at midsouth at realestateguysradio.com. Hello, this is Robert Kiyosaki. I'm the author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And if you're serious about learning how to invest in real estate, listen to the Real Estate Guys. They really know what they're talking about. Welcome back to the Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks for tuning into the show today. It's our series, The Road Ahead. Great stuff from Brad Sumrock, the apartment king, focusing on what he and his team are watching. We're going to transition into what's happening in the legal side of real estate, specifically in real estate private placements and syndications. But first, it's time to play real estate trivia. That's your chance to win a prize by knowing today's real estate trivia question. In just a minute, when you hear the question and think you know the answer, you'll send your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Send us your name, the answer to the question, and your physical mailing address because the first person that gets it right gets an awesome book called The One Thing That Changed Everything, a collection of inspiring stories by all kinds of cool folks. Oh, and yours truly. That could be yours if you know today's real estate trivia question. Last week on the program, we had a conversation with George Gammon and we asked this, in which U.S. state will you find the town of Tightwad? Well, Tightwad is in the great state of Missouri. 
Most legends surrounding the town's name tend to trace it to a postmaster who was upset with a cheapskate watermelon farmer who sold a promised melon out from under him for an extra 50 cent profit. But these days, the main draw to this tiny town in central Missouri is its bank. Customers from all over the country open accounts there just to be able to send checks with the Tightwad logo on them. Here's our real estate trivia question for this week. In which U.S. state did home prices rise the most during 2021? Yeah, home prices were up everywhere, but which state saw the most increase? If you think you know or just want to make a guess, send your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Give us your name, the answer, and your mailing address. If you're the first one that gets it right, you'll get a copy of The One Thing That Changed Everything. That's today's real estate trivia question. It's the next in our series of The Road Ahead. What are folks looking at, thinking about, and watching as 2022 unfolds? And taking a nice little diversion, talking about some real estate uh, this year. And to continue that, let's welcome our good friend and real estate syndication attorney, Mauricio Raul. Hey there. Hey, Robert. How you doing? I'm good. And it's good to see you. I know we're going to see you at the upcoming syndication event, but uh, there's some things that have gone on uh, since we've had you as a guest that I thought maybe you would talk about since legally uh, we've seen a few changes. And then we'll talk about where you guys see the puck going. Yeah. So there's actually been a lot of changes over the last you know couple of years, 12 to 18 months. Um, and some of them we put some out some content about. But, but by far, I think the one that most people are still not aware of, which I think is a really, really big deal, actually, is this concept that we can now do a syndication where we can start doing one with the 506B exemption. As everybody remembers, we're always looking for an exemption. And 506B is the most common. Most of our clients use that. Yep. But the challenge with 506B is you cannot advertise, right? That's always been the big, the big limitation. And we all know about 506C as well, which, which does allow us to advertise. But of course, we can only take accredited, right? So there's always this pull and tug. Well, there's a new rule now that came out that actually allows us to basically do both the 506B and the 506C in the same same offering in the same syndication deal, which means you can actually have non-accredited investors in your deal and advertise. Okay. Which is amazing, right? So this is this is brand new stuff that's been less than a year old and not too many people are talking about it, but we've had a, quite a few clients taking advantage of that. Now, Mauricio, this is different from what we talked about at our syndication mentoring club when you explained how to transition from one to another. This is starting out of the gate with a syndication that can attract both accredited and non-accredited investors. It's starting out of the gate where you know you're going to attract non-accredited investors and advertise, but we do do it one at a time. Right. So it's very important that we start with the 506B. So let's say we're raising money, we're raising capital for a hundred unit apartment building. Right. And we need to go raise a couple million dollars. Uh, we have non accredited in our list. We want to accept those non accredited but we also want to advertise. So maybe we, we, we feel like we don't have enough in our database. We want to go advertise. So there's always been that dilemma. And until recently, uh, we, we would have had to basically wait six months between those two, you know, between starting a 506B, we'd have to wait six months and then that didn't really work. But what we can do now is we can start a 506B, bring in our non-accredited investors, all of our friends and family and everybody that we know, make sure we're complying fully with 506B. So, so at that point, no advertising, right? We can take up to 35 non-accredited investors. I mean, follow the rule to the letter of the law. But in the middle of your syndication, this is literally in the middle of your syndication, you can pivot. You can say, you know what? I've got all my non-accredited investors in. I, I'm basically done with my 506B and I'm going to pivot. And from this day forward, I'm going to start the same syndication, but we're going to use 506C, which then allows us to go out there and advertise for that same deal that we just had all these non-accredited in. We can advertise for that 506C deal and take... Uh, accredited investors only from that point forward. And of course, we must take reasonable steps to verify that they're accredited. So you don't advertise at the beginning when you're looking to bring non-accredited in. And as soon as you make this pivot, then all of a sudden, because you're just attracting accredited, you have the ability to advertise. That sounds pretty good. It's amazing because there's so many clients out there that would love to do a 506C, would love to advertise, but the challenge is they also have a bunch of non-accredited prior investors who are non-accredited, friends and family, they want to continue to bring into their deals. And so they're always kind of this, this catch-22. And starting March of last year, we're now able to sort of 
have your cake and eat it too, so to speak. Now we've mentioned accredited investors several times without really defining that. And it may be that some listeners don't understand, but also I understand there's some changes here. So maybe take us through real quickly what accreditation means and whether it's the person who is looking to attract those folks as a syndicator or someone that just wants to invest passively. Right. Some of the real estate syndications out there are going to be limited to accredited investors only. And that means somebody who has a net worth of a million dollars excluding their primary residence, or if you're going through the um, income criteria, it's $200,000 the last two years with a reasonable expectation of earning 200,000 or more this year. And if you're trying to combine that income with your spouse, it's actually 300,000. Now there's been a lot of controversy over the years that financial uh, wherewithal and, and having a bunch of money isn't necessarily the greatest criteria to figure out if someone is suitable for a particular investment. We all know uh, people who have a lot, a lot of money who are complete morons for lack of a better word. And then we all know a lot of people that don't have a lot of money and the smartest people in the room. So there's been a lot of debate over the years and the SEC finally came out last year, tried to expand that to non-financial criteria. And so what they've done is set up a framework whereby somebody can actually take some courses, get certified as a uh, accredited investor, take some courses, take an examination, and then somebody certifies them that they are in fact sophisticated and know what they're doing and, and become an accredited investor. That's the exciting part. The non-excited part is like with most of these, when most of these laws get passed, there's a bunch of regulation that has to make its way through the system. And so we don't know yet what those certifications look like uh, or you know, who's gonna be able to certify them. Is this a weekend course, a semester, a year long course? We know there's going to be some kind of an examination, sort of a test, right? And then it would be certified. But that's one of the things that is coming down the pipeline. But as of today, there are some people who have certain certifications that do qualify as uh, credit investors. And those are primarily investment advisors, right? So if you've got a Series 65 license, a Series 7, a Series 82, uh, and you are a registered investment advisor, then you are automatically an accredited investor no matter what your level of income or net worth. So that's an accreditation for yourself personally. If I have my Series 65, I can invest as an accredited investor, even though I don't have the income or net worth requirement. That's right. So if you've got a Series 65 or if you're out there and you're not accredited and you think you really are missing out on a lot of these great opportunities and would like to become an accredited investor, well, you can go out and study for a Series 65 license, which isn't that hard, to be honest with you. Get the license, register with your state, and boom, you're now an accredited investor and eligible for all these other deals. All right, good stuff. So what else are you guys paying attention to in the new year? One of the things we're seeing quite a bit of, and, and this is why I'm super excited, I've got Bethany LaFam on, on with us today. And, and by the way, this is our first, this is her debut, Robert, in the uh, Real Estate Guys uh, radio podcast. So super excited to have Bethany. Bethany is our managing partner, basically handles all of our funds and most of our uh, workload here at the firm. And so she's super experienced in funds. And we've seen a huge uptick in people wanting to do a fund, uh, whether it's a blind fund or a fund of funds. And so I, I would like Bethany to talk a little bit about that because she's there in the front line in the trenches of, of, of kind of letting people know what exactly the difference is between putting together a fund and what most people think of a syndication, which is project specific. But uh, Bethany, why don't you, uh, first of all, why don't you introduce yourself to the uh, Real Estate Guys uh, tribe and uh, and then talk a little bit about what we're seeing on on the on the fun side hi thank you and robert thank you so much for having me on I, i'm happy to be here welcome to the program thank you thank you uh yeah i'm, I'm the managing partner for premier law group now and so um we've been seeing really since covid in and you know when people figured out the world wasn't actually going to end for real that people came out of the woodwork and and were trying to make up for lost time and they really wanted to have money at the ready so that they could go and and find deals and not have to worry about scrambling to raise capital while they were trying to close as well, which is awesome in theory, right? Um, the thing that we always advise our clients is that when you're raising a fund, your investors are betting on the jockey and not the horse. Yep. So you've got to have a track record or a following or 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 right. You've got to have something because they don't have dirt to look at and, and you don't have a, a pro forma and projections and you know you're you're trailing 12 and all of those things that you look for when you're when you're defining whether deciding whether or not you want to invest in a in a single syndication. With that being the, the sort of starting point, we've got a lot of veterans that came they came out of the woodwork and we're like, you know what, it's just we're gonna do this all at one time. We're gonna raise 10 million, 15 million, whatever it is. We know we can spend that money. And we know we can spend it well. And so then all you're having really to do is convince your 
investors that you're the manager that can choose the, the right properties and manage them well and get them a good return. Um, and, you know, everybody likes to diversify a little bit, right? So it makes it kind of exciting for the investors because they don't have to do diligence on any anybody except you. Uh, they don't have to look at every single, every single property because they're paying you to do that for them. Well, we've definitely seen this trend, right? A lot of syndicators over the years find a specific property and raise the money to develop that property or rehab that property or turn that property around, make it more valuable and sell it, whatever their plan is. But there's always been opportunity in this space, which is instead of a property, we have a target of opportunity we are after. Our fund is going to do A, B, and C. And the challenge with the fund, in my book, is always that it's a little nebulous. How much do I raise? And what happens if the money's sitting idle and all those things? So take us through how you counsel clients to approach a fund. Sure, sure. You know, and, and it being nebulous means it's really a lot of fun for us because we get to help structure, right? So that means more fun. Really what you need to decide is what is the asset class or classes that you want to focus on? A lot of people, they already have their niche, right? It's mostly multifamily or it could be, you know, could be mobile home parks, could be storage, whatever it is. Uh, we first advise not to have too many different asset classes. In the same fund. In the same fund. Um, you can have a few and we can, but the thing to remember is that we're going to have to write risk disclosures for every single asset class. And so you might turn off some investors if you've got, you know, your risk disclosures are, are longer than your pitch deck, right? Right. So people get a little turned off by that. And, you know, investors have different appetites for, for risk. So multifamily might feel good to somebody and, and, you know, mobile home parks might feel good to someone else, but combine them in together and you might turn a few folks off. So we advise to try to keep it to no more than three asset classes. So that's the first part of it. The second part is the raise amount is pretty important. Um, you know, the question is how many properties do you think you're going to want to or be able to find in some reasonable period of time? And then also, what is your goal for, for your investor base? Is your goal to provide cash flow? Is your goal to provide some upside? You know, who who is your investor base? Do you think? And so we we can structure a fund to achieve that goal. So if you want to keep it open for a while, then we don't think that you really should have upside because it's really hard to determine what the equity splits would be if someone comes in today and then someone comes in in three years and you sell a property three years in one day, right? So so where is the upside stuff? But if it's just a pref then it's simple, right? We can do it if that's the goal. It's just a little bit more complicated. And then, you know, we have to talk about how does money come in and how does money go out, right? So when, how does money come in? If you're raising a $10 million fund, are you confident that you can spend all that money right away? Or do you need to call just a portion of that capital and then call the rest later? And if you do, how are you going to tie your investors to make sure they actually make good on the rest of that 80 or 90% they owe you. So they are not back to raising money for property every time, right? So we will help build in, you know, some rules around that. And the next thing to look at is how do people get out? Are you going to allow your investors the opportunity to get out before you're done with the fund? So we call that a redemption option. And if you do, we've got to write a bunch of rules around that. Uh, do you want the option? to buy out your investors before you've sold all the properties, which is really cool for you. It does effectively, it, it sort of limits the upside for the investors. You've got to tell them what that's going to look like. But the cool thing for the fund manager is that you can use investor dollars, get them a really nice return, buy all these properties, and then own the properties free and clear of investors in the end. Everybody's happy. It's fun because you know a lot of clients are super excited to do funds and, and there's they are so nebulous, like you said, Robert, there's so many things to think about in a fund that just don't come up in a project specific. So usually it takes a little bit more time to put those together, but it's really a lot of fun. And, and if people are interested in, in trying to get the money in the door first and not have to stress about raising and raising the money and, and, and having a deadline, it, it's definitely something that not only should they look at, but a lot, like I said, a lot more clients are, are calling us to do funds these days than they did like Bethany said, uh, you know, um, a, a year ago or 18 months ago. Well, and I think that makes a lot of sense. It's always the dilemma when you have a close date and you haven't raised the money and all of a sudden you're out, uh, you know, every night on calls and things trying to get the capital in because you have this big deadline. That doesn't happen in a fund. Instead, it's the other way around. You pitch investors on, hey, this is the target we're after, either the physical markets or the type of properties. These are the kinds of returns we're interested in. And once you know you have that backing from investors, then it puts you in a different position. So like that. All right. 
we wouldn't be able to complete this conversation without talking about what's happening next in terms of real estate and uh, the changes in the way real estate is titled and tokenized with blockchain. Tell us what you're seeing there. That's something that's really popped up. So, so the funds have been going on for probably a, a year or two, right? And that's something that I think we'll continue to see moving forward. But the other thing that's been fascinating to watch is over the last, I would say the last three months, honestly, just towards the end of last year and the beginning of this year, we're getting a lot of people calling, uh, wanting to know about tokenizing their syndications, right? Which is super interesting. Obviously, you know, Bitcoin and you know all the the, the cryptocurrencies and blockchain. That's all sort of the, the raving uh, topic that people want to talk about. But I truly believe, and Bethany and I have talked about this a lot, that in the next, let's call it, ten years. You know, I think all real estate is going to be tokenized. I mean, instead of having sort of ownership in the form of what we have now, a deed of trust that's recorded with the county recorder's office, uh, we believe that real estate will be uh, in the form of a token that's going to be living on the blockchain. And that's going to be something that you can, you know, it's fungible, so you can you can sell pieces of it. It's going to, the transferability is going to be much, uh, uh, much easier. Now, that piece, I don't believe it's been happening much, but people are already syndicating real estate deals and then tokenizing those interests. So instead of people, I mean, they're still getting membership interests in the LLC, but those membership interests are actually tokenized. And the exciting thing about the tokenization is the liquidity, right? Right now, one of the big negatives of a syndication, you know, when you compare it to the stock market, for example, it's a very illiquid investment, right? You invest $50,000 in a syndication, you're not stuck, but you're in it for five years, seven years. It's not like you can then suddenly say after a year that you want to sell it and you can go to some exchange or the, you know, the Wall, you know, Wall Street or, or sell it. Uh, but tokenization, if you, when you can tokenize those interests and you can now start selling and trading those tokens on some kind of an exchange, that's going to open up, I think, a whole new world. And some uh, forward-looking syndicators are already uh, doing that. I know one of our, our good friends, Michael, has, has, has a sort of an event that he does annually on that. But that's something that we're starting to really do a deep dive in because I think that's just going to keep growing and growing. And before you know it, um, all of your real estate syndications will not be share certificates or membership certificates. They'll be actual tokens that you can trade on the blockchain. A lot of advantages to it. It does take a while to get your mind around it, but I'm glad you guys are watching that. All right. Well, we appreciate you guys uh, chiming in on this conversation because it's one of the areas that we do see rapid change. And I know that accreditation is changing. You mentioned that. Marisa, you put together this checklist. Tell us about that. And before we're done, we'll tell the listeners how they can get a copy of it. Yeah. So a lot of people are calling us saying, hey, Mauricio, you know, when are these new rules going to come in to allow my investors who are non-accredited to invest? And I, the best I can do this right now is say, we don't know when it's coming down. You know, the SEC takes its sweet time. We've also had a, a regime change that always affects things. But right now, they do have the option of getting a Series 65 license, which I think is the easiest license of all three. And so that's sort of your shortest path to accreditation. So we decided to put together a little checklist, uh, sort of a checklist on how to go about obtaining a Series 65 license so that if you are a passive investor and you'd like to start uh, participating in some uh, investments that are accredited only, that's something you can take a look at and, and, and go through that process and get your Series 65 and become an accredited investor. All right. Well, before we're done, we'll let you know how you can get your hands on that. And of course, we're going to see both of you guys at the upcoming Secrets of Successful Syndication. We have a very packed house. It's going to be a great event. That event has just been, you know, we've been doing it for how many years now, Robert? I don't know, 10, 12 years? Uh, 10 years. Yeah, our first one was 2011. Yeah, so this has got to be like number 20. So uh, I think I've been to every single one of them except one. And uh, it's always an amazing event. Uh, not only does uh, the faculty obviously is always outstanding, but just the caliber of people that show up to that event. The network is, an out is outstanding. And so I'm really, really excited to go back and also bring... Bethany with us uh, for the first time. It's going to be her first uh, syndication seminar. And uh, for everyone who's uh, used us, it's going to be a great time for you guys to meet her in person. Awesome. Marisa is one of the few faculty members that does more than one presentation because if you're going to raise money, it's important that you follow the letter of the law. And I think an even more exciting reason to come would be to meet Bethany, especially if you're thinking about investing in a fund or putting together a fund. So guys, really appreciate uh, the input today. And we'll see you at the Secrets of Successful Syndication. Thanks, Robert. Thank you. There's Mauricio Raul and Bethany Laflamme. More when we come back, you're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Need help with your real estate investment portfolio? Check out the resources page at realestateguysradio.com. Hey, ever wished you could go back in time and do some tax planning? Now you can, just like Marty McFly. 
Lucky for you, a brand new federal law just made this possible with an EQRP to get tax deductions and reduce your taxable income from last year. So you can use that tax savings to invest in real estate, Bitcoin, gold, even your own business. Whether you're a full-time investor, doctor, government employee, even if you have five or 50 employees, the EQRP works and is your secret weapon. And now it's retroactive. Hey, I'm Damian Lupo and we have your solution. By the way, if you got bad advice and used an IRA for an apartment syndication, you are sitting on a U-bit time bomb. But don't worry, there's a solution, the EQRP. The EQRP company is ready to help you get control of your money, kill U-bit, and help you pay way less taxes. Want to learn more about this strategy? Send an email to EQRP at realestateguysradio.com for my special EQRP report. Paying tax or letting Wall Street suck you dry is dumb. Your first step is freeing your retirement money by sending an email to EQRP at realestateguysradio.com today. Hungry for more real estate investing ideas? Here's two steps you can take today. First, go to realestateguysradio.com and sign up for our weekly newsletter. You'll get access to a continuous feed of thought-provoking commentary specifically for real estate investors while also focusing on broader picture economics. Then, once you're at our site, look for the Resources tab where you'll find our amazing collection of special reports. Browse dozens of white papers, webinars, and market reports and request the ones that appeal to you. What are you waiting for? Head to realestateguysradio.com to implement education for effective action. Hey, this is Phil Collin from Def Leppard and Delta Deep. You're listening to The Real Estate Guys. And welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks for tuning into the show. You still may have time to grab one of the last remaining seats at the Secrets of Successful Syndication. All of our guests will be there. Will you? Just send an email to syndication at realestateguysradio.com for all the details. Well, my goodness, that was a whole bunch of looking down the road ahead. Yeah, it's great information. And I always appreciate Mauricio's uh, perspective because he's dealing with a lot of syndicators. These are street level investors that have kind of gone one level up from being an individual mom and pop investor to taking on private capital and raising money from street investors. And as we've seen the trends, as a lot of money globally has been pouring into U.S. real estate, uh, it kind of gives you an indication. You know, we say all the time, follow the big dogs. And if you look at what the big players are doing, they're seeking a safe haven in real estate. And one of the niches that's very, very popular for institutional investors are apartments. Now it makes it hard if you're a street level investor to find those deals. That's why we appreciate Brad because he finds a way to go out in the street and compete with those guys. But it's also an affirmation that you're in the right space. Mauricio gets a chance to see that also as he works with people who are putting those types of deals together. So, and the other thing too, about the legal side of it, just like when we had Dr. Martinson on and he was talking about the policies that grew out of the COVID crisis, you know, you may think, oh, these legal things don't really affect me or, oh, the policies that the government makes doesn't really affect me, but they really do. And when you understand kind of how these changes are rolling out and how they might affect you, they don't manifest the minute they pass or the minute something changes. They kind of build over time as people adjust. And so we like to get these interviews, talk to the people who are at the cutting edge of policy changes, legal precedent, and and then seeing how people are reacting. Because as that starts to roll out, it gives us an indication where we want to position ourselves and our capital to take advantage of or avoid risk. 100%. And although real estate investors tend to stay closer into the weeds, looking at the markets they're in, dealing with property management, understanding what's happening in the rent growth and eviction law and those kinds of things, we all have to pull our head out of the sand and look at the bigger picture. If you're interested in being a fly on the wall for Brad's apartment forecast, all you have to do is send an email to brad22, brad22 at realestateguysradio.com. If you'd like that checklist of what it takes to become an accredited investor through a Series 65 license, just send an email to Series 65 at realestateguysradio.com. Series 65 at realestateguysradio.com. Big thanks to Mauricio and Bethany and Brad for sharing their ideas. We've got a few more episodes in this series, The Road Ahead, so stay tuned. Until next week, go out and make some equity happen. This episode of the Real Estate Guys Radio Show is brought to you by Paradigm Life. Powerful cash management strategies using life insurance. Learn more at beyourbank.com. Mid South Home Buyers, low cost, turnkey cash flow properties in Memphis, Tennessee. Corporate Direct, asset protection strategies for real estate investors from attorney and rich dad advisor Garrett Sutton. 
Find these and other great companies under the Resources tab at realestateguysradio.com. To learn how you can expose your product or service to the Real Estate Guys audience, call 888-489-7723, extension 4. That's 888-489-7723, extension 4. Or use the feedback page at realestateguysradio.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week right here on the Real Estate Guys Radio Show.